Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started with our first speaker. Stephen Cato is the Alzheimer's Texas Education and uh, Consultation Specialist. Stephen began his career in gerontology in 1998 after having been a successful manager and later retail store owner. In 2003, he began working as a memory care director. Stephen holds certifications in gerontology and gerontology case management. He's a certified activity director, assisted living director, excuse me, assisted living manager, validation therapy trainer, and positive approach to care trainer and dementia coach. Will you please put your hands together and welcome Stephen Cato. Thank you all. I hope you can hear me. Can everyone hear me? Good. We're gonna, oh good, today is the 25th, right? We're, we're hopefully going to talk about some new things for you. Some of you have heard me before. But um, we're going to talk about enhancing the communication. By that, um, I mean enhancing your visit if the person doesn't live with you, but also enhancing your approach with the person if they do. You'll see where I actually write PLWD. Anyone have any guess what that's going to mean? We've changed our thinking, and uh, there's a big deal with culture change right now. We no longer refer to a person with Alzheimer's or a person suffering from Alzheimer's or has Alzheimer's. It's a person living with dementia. Like with any disease, we want the person to live and to be all they can be at that time. I know that sounds like the army, doesn't it? Okay, we're going to change to the next slide. Dementia is an umbrella term. I'm going to kind of rush through these so we can get to the communication. There are reversible causes, which are going to be um, medication interactions. Um, sometimes uh, we'll have infections. Urinary tract infections are probably our worst enemy. Um, we, uh, even alcohol related can be reversible, but it can also turn into a um, permanent dementia that's called Korsakoff syndrome. Vascular dementia is anything that restricts the blood flow to the brain. That includes what we used to call and still call multi infarct dementia, which is uh, stroke related. Sometimes strokes are recoverable. I'm a survivor, I had a stroke four years ago. And uh, let me tell you, it gave me a whole new perspective because I spent months of kind of fogginess before things came back for me. Um, Frontotemporal dementia are something we're seeing more often. Uh, we used to have what we call pugilistic dementia, pugilism, boxers, uh, Muhammad Ali, he lost the ability to speak. Frontotemporal, a lot of this frontotemporal dementia is lose the ability to speak really quickly. Um, we see that a lot with the, um, well, the NFL brought that to, to everyone's attention about head injury. Um, Lewy body dementia, has anyone ever heard of Lewy body? Anybody dealing with that in their family? Lewy body is a little different. It's probably the most underdiagnosed dementia because it looks exactly like Alzheimer's to start with. So usually they'll say you have Alzheimer's type dementia. And it looks like Alzheimer's until it doesn't. And it actually begins to take on more of a Parkinsonian effect. Not necessarily tremors, but freezing up, um, loss of speech, a lot more um, hallucination both visual and uh, auditory. Usually they'll see people, mostly children and small animals. So, um, and that's, that happens also with Parkinson related dementia. They'll see a lot of children and small animals. Alzheimer's disease is the number one dementia. It's the one that we see the most of. It's, uh, now of course with all dementias we have a hard time with um, diagnosing. It takes a battery of about six hours of testing to really come up with a diagnosis. 
Um, but the uh, Mayo Clinic now says we have over 80 known dimensions. Um, I heard one of the doctors from Baylor at one time, Dr. Rachel Duty. Has anyone ever heard of her? I just like saying Dr. Duty. <laughs> but <laughs> Dr. Duty says it may be infinite. There may be some people that have a dimension no one else will ever have. But uh, with Alzheimer's Texas, we help you with all types of dementia. So just because we're called Alzheimer's doesn't mean that that's all that we do. Next slide, please. Alzheimer's disease accounts for about 70% of most dementias, 17% vascular, and 13% other dementias. You'll see up here 340,000 Texans have Alzheimer's and over 5 million Americans. That's probably a very low um, account because we have, um, usually you're two or three years into the disease before you go for diagnosis. Before you, We have great coping skills as, a, as humans. Okay, let's go through these real quickly. I'm trying to speak through these. Sex leading cause of death is Alzheimer's disease. People over 65 are at greatest risk. Um, under 65 is considered early onset. Early onset disease often um, has a little bit more of a genetic trait possibly. That's the thought and with some people it may move a little faster. But we can't let that strike too much fear into us because let's be honest, every disease has a genetic component. You know, you, you're either susceptible or not. So, um, typical duration is 4 to 10 years. I've heard of people lasting 20 years or more, but not that often with Alzheimer's disease. There are no disease modifying treatments. There are a couple of drugs. You probably have all seen the advertisements for Aricepin, Namenda, and then that new one that combines both. Um, Aricept is of a class that's called cholinesterase inhibitors, and we think that that may help the plaques to not form as quickly, but there's not really enough proof, even though it's been around for 30 years, uh, or at least the cholinesterase inhibitors. Um, memantine, or Namenda, affects the glycogens in the brain, and that's another theory, but they don't slow the disease process down. They may relieve symptoms for a period, and that's one thing doctors, uh, especially GPs, will put people on them and just leave them on it, but it's only effective for a period, usually. Um, some risk factors can be controlled, but they cannot, can't be definitively prevented. Okay, next slide, please. Look at the difference between the healthy brain and the Alzheimer's affected brain. We shrink about a third of the size in brain size. Um, Tipa Snow, who is one of the, the most, has anyone ever heard of Tipa Snow? I'm going to talk about her work. Tipa Snow, um, she's spent 30 years as an occupational therapist. And we're going to do a lot with her communication as well as Naomi File, who created the file method of validation. Tipa, this is kind of a horrible thought, but it's true. If our head actually shrunk in accordance with our disease, people would treat us differently. Um, you know, we don't look at someone with Down syndrome and see a person that is going to be able to fully function, you know, with uh, reasoning and mathematics and everything. By the way, Down syndrome actually has some correlation with Alzheimer's disease. A lot of studies are going on. The uh, genetic uh, component APOE4 is also the genetic variance that causes Down syndrome. Most people with Down syndrome, in fact, about 100% of them, when they reach age 50 or 45 or so, will have plaques and tangles of Alzheimer's disease. It doesn't present the same because they spend their life in a training type situation. Next slide. Symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. If I ask you what is Alzheimer's disease, most people will tell me memory loss. 
Uh, there's a lot more to it. Disoriented to time and place. There is a period with Alzheimer's disease where people make time travel, may come up and say, where's my husband, where's my husband? And he's been dead 10 years because of the time traveling event. Problem with planning, problem solving, and lack of focus, that means completing tasks. You can say, let's get ready to go to the doctor and they'll partially get started and then stop. Um, language problems, we're really gonna talk about that. Um, misplacing things and inability to retrace steps. Misplacing also includes hiding things and accusing people of stealing them. Uh, <laughs> loss of visuospatial skills. We're going to talk a lot about the vision changes. Uh, difficulty with old skills and familiar tasks. And uh, mood and personality which uh, changes as well as withdrawal. You uh, folks that actually you may go here or the church you go to, you may notice some of your older folks stop coming. And they stop coming because they don't want people to notice the changes. Okay, next slide, please. Normal age-related changes, occasional moments of forgetfulness. Who, how many of you ever walk into a room and think, why did I come in here? <laughs> um, and you know, I've had 20-year-olds that raise their hand because, yeah, you do forget that. That's normal. That's okay. Um, how many of you are wondering why am I here today? <laughs> um, forgetting the day of the week from time to time. That happens to me a lot, especially if I travel and I wake up in a hotel. Like, okay, what day is it? Where am I? Um, tip of the tongue difficulty, but they remember later. You know that actor, that actor that was in, you know, you know that movie. Um, misplacing glasses and remote controls, I'm going to tell you guys a little secret. Hearing aids too, look in Kleenex boxes. I swear I have found so many things that have been tucked in the Kleenex box. Frustration, area, irritability, and keeping character when routine is disrupted. Um, yeah, routine really helps. Has anyone ever heard of the Nun Study? It's still going on. There's a book called Aging with Grace. It's a little clinical. Really cool. They've studied a, a group of nuns in Minnesota, and even there's a group in Dallas. They had to get permission for the Vatican to donate their brains. Um, but it's amazing because they're the perfect group. They get up at the same time. They pray at the same time. They eat at the same time. They eat the same thing. Their days are routine. And upon autopsy, there was one that was 102, I think, and she was uh, working in the gift shop. Yeah, she had difficulty making change. Who at 102 wouldn't? Well, when they autopsied her brain, she was actually in the very latest possible stage of dementia. But she functioned because of routine. That's why it, uh, I say it presents differently with people with Down syndrome, because of their routine. Um, needing occasional help with familiar technologies. I tell you, I can't tell you how many times my, I couldn't reach my mother and I had to call her neighbor. And they would go over and she would have the television remote hung up on the phone receiver to charge. And her phone would be dead because they were the same size. <coughs> Slowing down and not as many activities. Not enjoying things that they've enjoyed before. Next slide. Here we go. This is the stuff that I'm working on. Visual changes. I'm going to ask you guys to do something, and you don't have to, but um, you may want to. Um, would anyone like to volunteer to come up here and be my person with dementia? Somebody come up, please. Okay. Thank you. Oh, I got two. Okay. <laughs> if you'll come up. And you can come up, too. <laughs> Early dementia. Now, when we're in our 20s, our field of vision, wide open, we see peripherally perfectly. I mean, my fingers are wiggling now. I'm 56. I know I'm wiggling them because I feel it, but I can't see them. In our 40s, our vision field comes in like this. We still have peripheral, but it's not as clear. In our 70s, it comes in like this. It's the field of vision is much smaller. Now, with dementia, 
early dementia, and Tipa Snow, the one I mentioned before, she's worked with a, a number of doctors at um, the Pines of Sarasota and Dr. Alan Power, who I'm going to talk about a little later. All of these doctors are agreeing with her that this is happening. If you'll all do this, like, like scuba goggles, no, not like binoculars, I see binoculars, but like scuba goggles. Not binoculars, scuba goggles like that. Yeah, you can know. That's what early stage dementia sees. You see right in front of you. And, you know, so somebody walking up to you can be pretty challenging. Now, mid-stage, we're going to go binocular with our vision. Now, binocular, we're still getting two images bouncing off our occipital lobe, and they're still being interpreted, but they're interpreted a little slower. So when we're in binocular vision, and we as Texans tend to go right in and start touching or start hugging. So I'm going to do you this time. Do this. Okay. How does this feel when I come up to you and do this? You all you love me. <laughs> but, but it is pretty invasive, isn't it? I did a, a, a talk at Backstrop last week, and I had this man, this little country man that was a farmer, and he stood up and he was doing that, and I walked right up on him, and I said, does that bother you? He goes, no. <laughs> and a little later, his wife came up, she said, you know what he said to me? I said, what? She said, he said you scared the heck out of him, but he wasn't going to let you know that. <laughs> so, but let's uh, go to the next slide. What was interesting when you did that is all of a sudden as you come to me, I have to, I'm trying to figure out your characteristics of what you are or who you are as you're coming at me. Like, all of a sudden, like, what is that? What the heck is that? Yeah, so even, and we go in fast. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and as Texans, we tend to touch. You know, and if you don't see my arms coming at you, what happens, and this is where this begins to happen, what kicks in is our limbic system. Everybody will do this right across the top of your head. Limbic system, that's where, um, oh geez, I just drew one. <laughs> I promise I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> in, the, the, um, in the limbic system, that's our primitive brain. That's the first part of our brain to start. That's the first part of our brain to end. That's where fright, fight, or flight come in. So if I come at you like that, and I'm blocking you, and you can't see around me, that's where the pushing may come in, or even the hitting, or the kicking, because you're invading my space way too. Just, just being that close. I mean, yeah, I see you clear as day, you have the right light on, it's still making me So everybody do this. Monocular vision, one eye. Now, I've had people ask me, do you mean one eye goes out? No, it doesn't. I'm saying the field of vision is small. There are two kinds of vision with a monocular vision because we're going two-dimensional now. So there's, look at me. See, that's why we have to change furniture when we get like this. Um, we have social vision, you guys in front of me, that's social vision, and we have task vision. If I'm working on artwork, and you come up and say, oh, that's really nice, and I look up, that's gone. You know, I can't do two, it's one or the other. 90% of people in late dementia have monocular vision, meaning their field of vision is like this, just really tight. So, with monocular vision, with one eye shut, and that's really invasive, isn't it? So, um, the thing is, we're, we're going to go through hearing shortly, but I want to show you a technique that's based on Tifa Snow's work. It's called Positive Approach to Care. And use this with families, use it with people you don't know if you go and visit. But um, I'm going to try you first, and I'm going to have you guys do this together, okay? So the person with dementia. I start out, stay there, I start out at public space, about two arm lengths away. 
name tag if I have it, if I'm a professional, is going to be on the right. I'm going to raise my hand. I'm not going to wave my hand. I'm just going to raise it because that's going to get your attention here. Hi, it's me, Steve. I'm going to reach out. Now, if he reaches back, I have permission to go in. If he doesn't, I'll show you what to do next. We're going to slip into like a, a gang handshake here. You know, slip to where you're holding like this. Um, let's turn to where you're facing folks a little better. And we're slip like this. I'm going to step to his side where he can still see me. I'm in a supportive stance. I'm not in front of him. The amygdala, the um, limbic system is not kicking in as much. If he's not looking at me, and I need to get his attention, a couple of hand phones. We'll get him to look over at me. If I need him to go with me, a scapular cue on the scapula, say, come with me. We'll help him to do that. The neat thing about this technique is if you're helping someone with a task, like getting dressed or getting undressed for a shower, there's something about flat pressure directly onto a joint that can pull the brain to thinking they're doing this. If I'm helping him to get dressed and I, I, he feels, you know, my hand, but I've got pressure there, I'm doing the buttons, he will literally feel like he's undressing, like he's doing it himself. If I'm helping someone to eat, flat pressure on the joint. Big gesture out till he opens his mouth, then I go in. You know, so um, is that new for anybody? We're all taught to approach from the front. We're still approaching from the front, but we're not staying at the front. So any of you that will like to stand up real quick and try this in pairs, try it. Come on, some of you do it at least. You guys try it. Who's going to have somebody decide who has the link and who doesn't? Okay, about six feet, public space. When we move in, when we move in and then the handshake, that is personal space. When we have our hand on someone, that is intimate space. Anyone think you can do this? Practice it. Practice it with your spouse. Practice it with your friends. You'll begin to be able to do this just without thinking. Pretty cool, huh? How many have had a difficult time getting your loved one to get dressed or undressed or get ready or whatever? That will... It doesn't work on everybody, though. Look at the Mahoney handshake. There you go. They forced me to write with my right hand. I write with my right hand. I cut the scissors. I use all tools. I even paint with my left hand, but I write with my right hand. So my dominant side truly is my left. Do I have any left-handed people in here? Can I have one lefty up here? I'm going to show you how to paint. You guys, thank you. I need one lefty. Okay. Thank you. I thought I'd wake you up by making you get up. Okay, so we're going to start six, about, about six feet out. Hi, it's me, Steve. I'm offering my hand. He's taking my hand. I'm moving in. Flat here. I know he's a lefty. And I say, may I take your other hand? Then I go over. It may not be comfortable for me, but it is for him. He's not going to be able to handle me doing anything with him unless I'm on his dominant side. 
So that's how you do it. You say, may I take your other hand? And they'll give it to you. Now, with family members, a lot of people tell me, well, it doesn't make sense to announce myself. Yes, it does. You know, <coughs> vision changes. We just talked about it. It's a good thing to say who you are. If you're the son or the daughter, say who I am. You don't have to reach like a handshake. If it's like your mother or something, you can just reach out. Take her like that and then switch into the homey handshake. Thank you. All right. So, anyone think they're going to go home and practice this a little bit? It can help a lot. Now, I said some people may not do well with this. If they don't reach back, you do not have permission to go in. Tipa calls, and she does gems, and she calls that a diamond because they're a very precious stone, but they're hard, they can cut, and they, but they respect authority, and they're authoritative. So when a person is in that personality, the best thing to do, if they're seated, well, can I sit here and talk and pull up a chair about six feet away and just a little cock to the side there and sit down and start talking? When you see them warming up to you, you can reach out for their hand. But if you try to reach some, somebody and they don't reach back and you go ahead and go into their space, or, or, and that's just our primitive brain. That happens. Fright, fight, or flight. That's always there. Okay, um, the LWD. <laughs> so, when, especially if the focus is diverted somewhere else, let's talk about auditory changes. In normal aging, there's a lot of visual and auditory changes that go on. You know, that happens. Um, you know, one thing I didn't mention with the visual is like macular degeneration. That can really kind of throw a monkey wrench in because they have a blank spot. But with um, auditory changes, as we age, there's normal stuff. But they're going to lose... Okay, has anybody... Back in the 70s and 80s, and I see some of you that were like that, um, <laughs> there was a book called Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain. Anyone ever read that book or try that? That was about using your creative side, not your um, analytical side. So our auditory is really actually on both sides of the brain. We lose the left first. We lose the left, which is where formal language is established. It's where comprehension is. Okay, I've got 15 minutes. It's where comprehension is. And um, so I'm going to drop probably about a quarter of the words you say. There's not a formula. It's not every fourth word. But you may say, let's take a shower. And what I miss is shower. And then you go pulling on my clothes. So I'm going to miss some words. That's going to happen. We're told to tell people every step we're doing. That helps. But the way we cue somebody is visual first, then auditory. Then we can touch. Until you do that order, you can't touch. So, um, the right side of the brain, that's going to stay intact. We have a few things there, and then we're going to get to questions. The right side of the brain, um, we have social chit-chat. I can't tell you how often I've had families for, uh, come to me and say, well, I think I made a mistake moving mom here. We just had the best visit. She talked about my brothers and my sisters. She talked about her sister. She really, really was there. So maybe I moved her in too soon. Then they leave, and here comes that lady, and she says, Have you seen my daughter? I've taught her better than this. I haven't seen her in months. Because she has some memory there, a little bit, of the vision of seeing her daughter. But um, social chit-chat can pull a doctor very easily, because they're limited in time. You can really pull a doctor. Um, now, the other thing that's really great is we have rhythm. Rhythm can be poetry, prayer, and music. You know, you hear so much about music. If you get a chance, 
Try and find the uh, documentary Alive Inside. It's incredible about people that no longer speak but wake up because of music. So um, with rhythm, though, there are chances that I may be able to get you to follow what I'm saying if I give you a rhythm to follow. I may be able to get you to understand this if you're listening to my rhythm. That takes practice, doesn't always work with everybody. You may have to sing the instruction. It's time to take the shower, it's time to take the shower, you know, rhythm's there. The, and real quickly, the last little treasure we have on the right side of the brain is this um, treasure chest of forbidden words. <laughs> All the words we've learned our whole life that we shouldn't say. It's where racial slurs will happen, where sex talk will happen, it's where curse words will happen, when I can no longer form formal language, you may be called a word. Or, um, you know, I, I always give an example. I, I had a gentleman that was a, a colonel. And one of my girls that worked for me said, every time I try to give him a shower, he grabs my behind. <laughs> and I said, okay, let me stand outside and listen. So I'm listening and she says, okay, Colonel, let's get your clothes off and get in the shower. <laughs> that's an invitation to a really intimate thing. So that's what he heard. And so that's where that was actually a sexual action, not just sex talk. Um, sex talk can happen. I've, I've had a lady with frontal temporal that was writing me love letters. And it was great for me because I knew not to go to her room without taking a female care attendant with me. But anyway, let's go to the next slide and see how much more we have. Question? Yes? Oh, so how would you phrase that to take a shower? It, it, depending on if I need to use rhythm or whatever, um, it's time to take a shower. I've already got it set up. I'll let you smell the, the soap and everything. Do you need help? Now, we always want to match our help with what their needs are and what their abilities are. Sometimes he may be able to do just fine with rest. Do you need a little help? You know, do my thing like this. And um, I'm going to hand you a washcloth and say, you do everything you can, and I'll help. I'll do your back and your feet, and you know, allow them to do as much as they can. Um, but yeah, we don't, um, some places will force into the shower, but you know what, if they miss one one day, it's not going to kill them, um, but if they miss two weeks, yeah, that's not good. So, um, did that help at all? Yes. Okay, that's the little treasures, the bad thing. Okay, let's do one more slide, see if there's more. Um, that's the, this is the part about the forbidden words. So we've already gone through that. Next slide. Communication symptoms, word finding difficulty, repetition of words, phrases, and stories. Loss. And who deals with repetition? I'm going to pick you up at 9 in the morning to go to the doctor. So every 20 minutes I get a phone call. When are we going to the doctor? 2 in the morning. I'm dressed. Where are you? We're supposed to go to the doctor. So that happens a lot. Difficulty organizing thoughts in appropriate speech and cursing. Let's keep going. We've got to go quick. <coughs> Types of communication. Verbal. They will pay attention to what you look like more than they are to what you say. If you come in there rushed, getting them dressed, and you say, we've got to get somewhere right now or whatever, yeah, they're going to pay attention to all that body language first. Uh, but more so than what they hear. So, visual, verbal, then touch. Um, so, we need to pay attention to our own tone, uh, body language, positioning, gesture, eye contact, expressions, but also pay attention to theirs. They're going to communicate with you. Okay, next slide. Making a positive physical approach. We did that. 
Come from the front, smile, go slow. We have to learn to slow down. Get to the side, get low if they're sit seated especially, offer your hand, palm up, or use the person's preferred name. I always had a problem with caregivers and facilities that, you know, they're 22 and they're calling somebody by their first name that's 85. So I always tell them, well, this is kind of Texan and Southern, say, Miss Betty or Mr. John, you know, it's just a little more genteel and it's a little more respectful. Um, especially with women, they may not remember, or they may have been married many times, and the last name's not going to be affected. Okay, next. I think I have, uh, I'm trying to get through this because I want to give you time. Okay, go to the, to the next slide. We already kind of went through that. These are the don'ts. You don't engage in an argument. You're not going to win. Um, don't attempt to reason with the person. Don't ever say, do you remember? Don't take anger or frustration personally. Do not correct. They're looking at a photo album. They say that's my sister, but it's their mother or it's them. Oh, well, isn't she pretty? You know, we don't correct things. Don't speak to them like a child. I hate that, hated that in facilities. Come on, honey. Come on, sweetheart. It's time to go. You know, no. I'm not your honey. Um, we can use pronouns if we use them appropriately. Okay, next slide. Okay, validating emotions. These are a Naomi file. Look her up on YouTube. You're going to love her work. F E I L. And also, uh, uh, the uh, file center is bfvalidation.org. Centering. Before you walk in a room with somebody with dementia, be okay with yourself. Take a few deep breaths. Don't go in there. Uh, Tifa Snow says, know your agenda. Don't show your agenda. You know, we're going in there clear. Having empathy, using non-threatening factual words. Asking questions like who, what, where, when, how. But we don't ask why. That requires abstract thought. Um, the next slide, okay. Wait a minute, I did go back one. Um, rephrasing. Somebody, I need to go home. I need to go home. Uh, I, I really have to leave. Will you take me? I need to go home. Oh, you need to go home. Some people need to know that they were hurt. So that's when rephrasing comes in. Using polarity. That man's in my room again. He's under my bed. He's in there again. I got five minutes. Yeah, he's under my bed. He's, he's in there again. I, the natural thing is for me to go in there and look and say there's no one there. But to go in there with them and say, I don't see him. Are there times that he's not here? That's polarity and opposite. Is are there times that he's not here? And that can help relieve things. Go to the next, please. Imagining the opposite. Reminiscing is a great thing. Maintain genuine close eye contact. Ambiguity is where we use pronouns when we don't know what they're talking about. Did that hurt you? Um, was, was that the best thing that happened today? You know, using a pronoun is fine. Or did he hurt you or did she hurt you? Well, let's go over here. Uh, clear, low, loving voice, observing and matching their emotion, mirroring, linking the behavior to unmet needs. Next, please. Identifying using their preferred sense. Everybody has a preferred sense. What does that mean? What is preferred that? sense. Listen to their words. If they say it looks like it's clear outside, how is it, you know, it, is it as pretty as I can see? Or um, I, I hear the birds out here. I hear, you know, so we have preferred sense. Or smell those wonderful flowers. You know, so listen to that person, sense and talk in those terms. Um, I really don't like the word vegetate, vegetation, but she uses that. Touching, except for the Mallory in it, which is the diamond to me. That's when the person is not responding. Okay, next please. 
Most importantly, follow their lead. They know where they're going, you know. Um, avoid saying, do you remember or remember when or any other phrase that challenges them and quizzes them. Don't correct even if they are recalling an inaccurate or maybe it didn't even happen to them. Maybe something that happened to their sister and they're saying it like it's their own memory. It's all right. Let it happen in the moment. Okay, is that it? Or is there more? Ah, there we are. Awesome. Thank you, all service Texas. So, I really kind of sped through this. Do I have questions on communication? Yes, ma'am. You have a. One um, moment. Is your PowerPoint available to some of the notes I would like to write down? Sure, sure. Um, Christian, if they uh, sign up for our newsletter, maybe put a star beside it, and we'll let them send you the PowerPoint. Okay. Yeah. Any others? Yes, ma'am. Christian's running. <laughs> and she's my boss. That's fun to make her. I don't have question as much as I have a gratitude because I listened to your talk last Thursday and I went to see my mother on Friday and I used a lot of those visual cues. I asked her permission to give her a hug and when I did that she just glowed uh, that I had entered this new way of relating to her. And you so thank you very much. Her. You know that's the one thing that we lose but thank you. That's awesome. Any other? We got a couple over here and a couple back here. Kristen's my boss. She's the president of all Alzheimer's Texas. Run, Christian. Run, 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 run. run. Okay. <laughs> my, my question is less. It's more about communicating the other way. I noticed that I need people just give me time to respond. Yeah, yeah. I remember I said slow down. Yeah. How, how, do, you, how do you present that to somebody? That... Tell them I need you to give me more time. You're, you're talking too quickly. Let me have more time. You know, that's one thing we're discovering more and more people as they age are speaking up for themselves. Speak up, say it. Just say, you know, I can't respond that quickly. You know, but I, I know what you're asking me. Just give me a moment. I, I think that's perfectly all right. And this young man here, like the youngest guy in the room up here. Uh, so, I work in the hospital, and I just want to ask you how you would handle this situation. I had a patient who had severe short-term memory loss. Every 15 seconds, he would try to leave the room. My job was to keep him in his room because he's in the ICU, and we can't have him wandering about. Uh, every 15 seconds, he tries to leave again. It became a me versus him situation. Uh, he kind of picked off on that. I wasn't going to let him do what he wanted to do, and he would become aggressive. And this would repeat every every 20 seconds, 15 seconds or so. How would you handle that situation so that I could calm him down? Are you a nurse? Uh, EMT. EMT. Okay. Um, that's a great question because hospitals are horrifying with somebody with dementia. <laughs> Two people fall and break a hip. One without dementia, one with dementia. A person with dementia is three times less likely to get the pain meds they need, and they're four times more likely to be put on an antipsychotic drug. So, with that situation, talking to the doctor, talking to the nurse, let's make sure pain needs are met, because I may be trying to get out because I need to get somewhere for some relief. So we need to take care of pain first. You know, we, we're seeing more and more people that are shying away from antipsychotics, which is awesome. But if the hospital gives an antipsychotic, usually it's a hardcore one, like Haldol, which is inexpensive. But if they'll treat the pain, often that will relieve that. And uh, you know, the problem is a nurse walks into a hospital room and ask a person with dementia, do you hurt? And they're going to answer the way they think you want to hear it. No, I don't hurt. 
Or where do you hurt? Well, I don't remember. I broke my hip. So I don't hurt anywhere. That, that's just the usual answer. So it takes more exploration, really watching their body language and then talking with the nurses and the doctors and say, look, he's trying to leave constantly. Um, can we take a look at his medications? Uh, it could be a medication that's causing anxiety. You know, um, sometimes it's something as simple as a, um, oh, what's my call it? I'm 56, it takes me long. <laughs> so, sometimes it can be an antibiotic. My mother was just total squirrel bait if you gave her Levacor, which is a very common one because they can give high doses and give it for a long time. But it whacked my mother out. She accused my brother of putting all those little buildings in her backyard and he filled them up with illegal aliens and she was not gonna go to, to jail for him. And it, you know, it was really bizarre. So it could easily be a medication reaction that's causing this too. Any other? Is that all? I can't hear. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you can't hear me now. I want to talk about there the crazy. How do you address the constant? You know, I want to go home. I'm going home. Uh, just all the time. I need to go home. Or I was home last week and you took me away and all of that. So Remember the the questions I told you you can ask, and I did it really quickly, and I apologize. I usually do like two hour around. Uh, but tell me more about that. You know, Mom, we haven't talked about home. It's usually where they grew up. It has nothing to do with where they lived with your father or whatever. That, depending on where they are in their, their disease process, I mean, and I'm not saying this because we're in the church, going home could mean I'm tired of this, I'm ready to go. You know, I want to go home. Or it's usually the home they grew up in. You know, Mom, I, I never saw where you grew up. Was it brick or was it made of wood? Then go on in further, explore further. What did your mother teach you at home? You're a great cook. Did your mother teach you to cook? Did Grandma teach you to cook? Use the name. Yeah. And really explore and exploring that. And even exploring that while you're walking, going for a walk if they're able to, around the block or whatever. And let them just really process home. By the time you get back, go in a different door. You went out the front, go in the back. They've been home. You know, people need to process things. Any other question? Yes, over here. Over here. Oh. <laughs> I'm referring to what you said about miss a day uh, about their shower, uh -huh. um, a day or two, but not two weeks. I work in an assisted living. Yes, you can miss a day or two, but family members get frustrated. They come to you as a caregiver and say, mom has not taken shower for a day or two. And they are on the schedule like Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. They have missed Monday already, Wednesday. And come Friday, their loved ones are uh, frustrated. And then they come to you, uh, still they are refusing to take a shower. What do you do? Well, that's a good question. Showers are probably the hardest thing to do. And like I said, I've been the member care manager in assisted living for almost 15 years. Um, honestly, because they're upset, I would say talk directly to the family and say, can you help me? Can you give me any ideas? Because I'm a stranger going in trying to give your mother a shower. Do you know of anything that may help her? Uh, would it be better if I play, um, you know, music in there, whatever. Tell me what might help because I really want to help, help your mother. I don't want her to be dirty. You know, but I, I just can't figure it out. And, you know, she's having trouble with the other caregivers, too. So, you know, really what was happening in most places, they were giving them a, 
a Xanax or something before the shower? No, we don't need to do that. But um, a lot of it's going to be the approach. You're not going to be right in front of her. You're going to assume a supportive role to the side. Um, you know, and I, I've all, always talked, I talked here not long ago, and I told everybody, um, when, don't go after the caregiver, I mean, don't go to the manager and complain first, go to the caregiver and ask them first, and say, what can I do to support you? Because some of these caregivers work two or three jobs, or they may be working a double shift, and just asking them makes them feel better if you say, how do I support you? Um, instead of going above their head, because then they get beat up. They get, you know, in trouble for it. But, but yeah, that, that happens. And um, showers are so difficult. Mostly because their generation may not have taken showers. They took baths. And they didn't take them all the time. They didn't take them every day, necessarily. Um, and they don't need to take it every day because it's bad for the skin of an old person. But, you know, talk directly to that family member and say, I want this to work. You know, smile and, and be very cordial. I really want this to work. Can you help me figure this out? I don't want this to be going on. Either. Did that help at all? Okay. She lives at home with us. We work out of our home. So it presents an interesting, unique situation because we kind of have an open concept. We work kind of in an open area. And we like that because that way we get to interact with her often. But there are times when my husband and I just are talking about work and really, really in a busy stage, having a conversation. And um, she, you know, interjects with you know, questions or answers that really aren't even related to what we're talking because, you know, she's not sure what we're even talking about. So it kind of, I didn't know how to respond to her to still, make, you know, make her feel included, make her feel good. We don't want to alienate her whatsoever. Right. I don't know if you had any suggestions on how to handle that. Well, maybe finding some outside sources. If you look on our table over here, there are some respite groups. And I know that sounds like, oh, maybe setting no. They actually, the, once a person starts going, they love the interaction. Christmas can vouch for respite groups being a wonderful thing. So getting her out of the house once a week or something. And also, do you talk honestly about her Alzheimer's or dementia? Um, she, yeah, she recognizes it. She recognizes it, talks about it. I'm not opposed, and I, I don't know how you feel, Christian. I think early stage, uh, here I'm putting her on the spot, but earlier stage people, I don't think it's a bad idea for them to see a therapist. You know, they're grieving their loss. So for them to have talk therapy, and if you go on psychologytoday.com and put in Austin, Texas, and put in the word Alzheimer's, you will find therapists that actually know something about the disease and can talk with the person. It may not um, be something that carries over a great deal, but the emotional part will carry over. They need to be able to talk about it, and she may need to talk about it with somebody other than you. So if she could be open to seeing a therapist, I, I do like for people to do that. What do you think, Christian? Sounds good. Sounds good? I, I mean, not everybody does well with that. I, I know we're out of time, but anybody else? All right, yeah, I just had a suggestion. Um, I know this is all person-centered, so um, I just have a suggestion for the shower. Um, uh -huh. For one, like, trying to get them into the shower, you could do a visual aid with a picture of the shower uh -huh. instead of just asking them to get in the shower so that they can see the picture and know that that's what they need to do. Um, another thing that worked for my grandmother is we actually got her doctor to, we recorded a video of him and just telling her you need to shower um, so that you don't get a rash um, and things like that and that actually helped her um, That's good. to get in. Um, so just every time the, doc the caregivers were having a hard time getting her into the shower they could show her that video. No two people have the same journey. So yeah, that's a great idea. 
So let's remember visual first, then verbal, then you touch. Yeah, so the visual is important. Mm -hmm. And the shower itself may be a confusing environment for them too. I know it's routine, but it still can be kind of traumatic. So we also had uh, written cues like get in shower, wash body, get out, sit down, dry off. Um, we had those. Um, we that, went and put them in and put them in the shower so that she could look at that as she was in the shower. Um, yeah, yeah. On a dry erase board is a checklist. Mm -hmm. You know, undress, get a shower. Yeah, you know, all that can uh, work. Uh, now the other thing about a shower, though, people's sensitivity changes. What feels warm or lukewarm to you may feel scalding hot to them. That shower beating down uh, may feel like needles poking them. We may need a softer setting or whatever. So yeah, that could be a question of, of comfort too. And make sure the bathroom's warm. You can't get a person with dementia in a shower in a cold bathroom. Sorry, just one more suggestion. Okay. Um, I also found that when people are confused about, like he said about the hospital, the guy trying to get out, or you know, like your mom asking you to go home, um, is to maybe, again, visuals um, tend to help, but just saying you are at blah, 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 you are here to get medical treatment until you get better, um, things like that, just so that maybe put it on the door, so that when they do try to get out or anything, they're able to see that big enough for them to, to really get their attention. Maybe Notes from a family member that say you're here to get better and they're taking good care of you, that can help, you're right. Um, real quickly, I told you I was going to tell you what G. Allen Power says and I'm running a little over, but um, this I think is cool. Dr. Allen Power, P-O-W-E-R, not Powers, but you'll find him on YouTube and stuff. He, plays folk music, I wouldn't watch those. But anyway, he is the author of Dementia Beyond Disease and Dementia Beyond Drugs. Those are two of my favorite books. But he redefines dementia. He says, with all diseases, we tend to define it by the disease and by the symptoms. With dementia, the best definition I've ever heard Dementia is a shift in the way a person experiences the world around her. What we need to be looking at is not the task, but how they're experiencing what we're doing. And we need to know when to back off. Uh, so it's looking at it from the other side, really understanding what they're experiencing. And it can take a while to figure that out. But you know, their experience with us is really what matters. Anything else before I run and hide? No, I'm just kidding. Okay. Let's, let's, uh, we're going to go ahead and move forward so okay. we stay on, on, on track with time. So That's let's hear it for Steve. Thank you.